I've got the great honor and privilege of introducing you today to Dr. Brian Carrier. And if, you're, if you've been around forensics for a while, you obviously know, uh, know Brian. And if you haven't been around, he's just definitely somebody that you want to keep track of. His, uh, his book on file system forensic analysis is kind of one of the seminal books in the DFIR world, which really, really takes you down to that, that atomic artifact level awareness from a, from a file system. And certainly that's not the only thing that he works with. Um, he's also a, uh, a developer behind several tools, uh, Sleuth Kit and Autopsy, which uh, he'll be talking a bit about here today and uh, works with basis technology on a variety of both community facing as well as uh, you know contract consulting type opportunities as well. Um, really good to have you here. Uh, someone I'm, I'm glad to call a, a, a colleague and a, a friend. And uh, that all being said, I'm eager to, uh, to hand this off to you, sir, for, uh, for talking to us a little bit about um, using a big DFIR data, kind of a follow on to some of the things that uh, Jess was talking about a minute ago. So I will hand it to you. Thanks. Um, so thanks for this opportunity to, uh, to present on this topic of uh, big data. Uh, and, and as Phil said, it kind of ties in with some of the stuff uh, discussed in, in the last talk. Um, there we go. So uh, for me, one thing I, I've come to realize is one of my uh, kind of um, missions uh, of the, the work that I do is all about kind of making uh, examiners more efficient. Uh, that there's a lot of people out there on the front lines, whether they're corporate incident response or law enforcement or military who are dealing with digital devices and investigating them. Uh, and what I really kind of focus on is like, how do we make all these people uh, more efficient to deal with all the diverse data sets and size of data sets? Uh, and that's really kind of what we, we focus a lot on. Um, some of these examples that um, you know we're going to tie into as part of this talk uh, are, are being able to like automatically flag things that you uh, tagged as bad before, so that you make sure you see them again. Uh, another big thing that we're we spending a lot of time on is ranking, right? Uh, it used to be forensics was all just about like getting access to data, right? Be able to view a file system and poke around every file and folder, uh, or doing a keyword search and getting lots of things. Um, that's not enough anymore. There's just too much data, uh, and it really needs some notion of kind of uh, ranking uh, and prioritization uh, with things that you can spend your limited time on those most important things. Um, you know, I like to view it as more of a, you know, back in the day in the 90s, there was, you know, Alta Vista, which was the best search engine because it had so much broad coverage. Uh, and then Google came in and their main thing, right, was the ranking algorithm. Um, I feel like in forensics, we're still quite a bit in that kind of uh, Alta Vista days of just showing you raw data uh, and not helping the users really see the most relevant stuff first. Um, another other main focus for us has been kind of getting context about something. Again, we can show you things, but being able to show like why it's used, how it's been used, where else you've seen it uh, to help you better understand what you're seeing. Um, all of these things that we've been solving recently by leveraging data uh, that you might be throwing away right now. Uh, a lot of people will go kind of case by case, right? They'll make a new VM for every case uh, coming from a mindset of contamination and not wanting to bring in data from a past case into the current case uh, and keep everything clean. Um, and, and yeah, getting a new VM every time and, and keeping everything contained helps you with that problem, um, but it means that these other problems become much more challenging uh, and you can't solve them. So we're going to talk today about reusing your data, kind of like a recycling approach. Here. Instead of throwing stuff away, uh, you know, recycling that, reusing that uh, that data uh, that you have as part of your past case to help you in the future. So this all comes down to history. There's a uh, a very old saying back in 2020. This guy Carrier uh, came with the saying, said, uh, you know, those who cannot remember the artifacts they saw before uh, are condemned to analyze them again. It's a very kind of, uh, you know, insightful uh, quote uh, that, that's lasted for, for many generations and many things, uh, has been parried over time, uh, including this guy back in 1905, uh, who said, you know, those who cannot remember the past, you can repeat it. But this is a basic idea, right? We kind of want to remember the history uh, in the past uh, to keep memories of all these things uh, moving forward uh, in your future investigations. And if you think about it, um, so much of what we do in forensics and response uh, is based on the past, right? Uh, we're trained at SANS or other courses uh, to do things based on uh, people before us, uh, what they thought was useful and what they saw in the past. Uh, our tools are designed to focus on data uh, in locations that were useful in past cases. Uh, hashes like the NIST NSRL uh, is hashes that someone in the past at NIST uh, knows that came from a known software, uh, and it's bringing in the past notion of what, what's useful or not. Um, 
hash sets for chat exploitation uh, or from past cases. IOCs are from past cases. Uh, topic keywords or drugs or child pornography or, or hacking or whatever are based on past experience. Um, there's so much of our investigations that are based on past knowledge that we bring in. And the trick is to kind of apply that past knowledge to your current case uh, and figure out the, the, the new unique parts of the current case. The challenge is scaling, right? It's hard to remember all the uh, notable things that you've seen. Uh, it's even harder to know the things that were notable in the past uh, that your colleagues saw. And as we've been going through trying to find things on relevance and making sure you see the most relevant things, uh, we've also realized the boring stuff you saw before is also interesting. Uh, because it was boring before, it's probably still boring. Uh, and now it becomes harder and harder to keep on figuring out all this stuff to remember. The general solution here is make your tools do all the remembering, right? That's what software is good at. That's what hardware is good at, to store things, to be your memory, uh, save as much data as you can, uh, and then figure out how to use it. Uh, we're going to talk, talk some features that we started building uh, a few years ago for different reasons, uh, but started collecting data. And much like the past talk on kind of data science and how uh, machine learning and AI and all these things uh, once you have data, uh, it becomes really powerful in terms of the things that you can do uh, that you didn't really anticipate uh, in the beginning. So uh, this talk has, talks about two things. Uh, one is autopsy, uh, and the other is cyber triage on how we've used this concept of collecting data uh, and using it to help the examiners uh, and the analysts be more efficient uh, with it. So first, let's talk about autopsy. Um, what is Autopsy? Autopsy is an open source digital forensics platform. Uh, hopefully many people here uh, know the basics of it. Uh, there's a couple slides here just to kind of get some context, but it's, this talk is not really about a deep dive on basics of Autopsy. Um, but the basic goals of Autopsy, since we redesigned it uh, five, six years ago, uh, is on ease of use uh, to be uh, easily approachable, kind of intuitive out of the box. Uh, and extensible. We've got a bunch of open plugin frameworks uh, and a bunch of third-party modules you can drop in uh, to build modules in Python or Java or whatever. Um, high level rate, we're supporting hard drives, MIDI cards, smartphones, um, has all the standard features plus some unique features. Here's a basic screenshot. Uh, tree on the left-hand side, uh, select something over here, a table over here, or thumbnails, uh, choose something there, and get various viewers on the lower right-hand corner not rocket science. Very simple, intuitive, part of the whole kind of easy to use concept here. The real trick here, just kind of knowing the kind of the structure of the tree so you know what nodes to open up as part of this. Um, but again, basic kind of three panel UI flow here. There's other UIs for timeline and pictures and other things, but this is kind of the main default uh, out of the box UI. Um, this is a screenshot of our training course uh, image. Uh, Brian Moran, if you're in, in this course right now, uh, shout out to him uh, who made th this data set uh, for our training set uh, where Renzik, our, our mascot here, uh, goes missing uh, and is part of the training course. You kind of solve uh, you know, where he is. Um, high level f features uh, you know, of the tool on the left hand side, you know, hash calculation, keyword search, registry analysis, web artifacts, email, carving, all the usual things. Um, unique things that aren't found in some commercial tools, especially not for free, uh, are things like multi-user collaborative cases where you can have you know, central servers and multiple users working on the same case at the same time. Uh, we think of auto ingest that automatically analyzes data 24 seven uh, if you put images into a folder. Uh, a cool thing called analysis driven acquisition, which means you plug like a hard drive or media card in uh, and you start your analysis on that. And as a byproduct, it will make a VHD sparse image. So you can kind of skip the acquisition step and focus right on analysis and then get that image as kind of a byproduct uh, and not take the time to actually make the full acquisition. Triage, timeline, communications, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Uh, not the point of talk, except for to give the big picture of, there's a lot of stuff in Autopsy uh, that covers a lot of the features. So um, today's topic is all about kind of big data, right? Collecting data, keeping track of things. Um, I view autopsy in, in cyber triage in, in two concepts here, kind of short-term memory uh, and long-term memory. So on the short-term memory, uh, autopsy is much like a lot of other forensics tools uh, where we organize things by case. And the main motivation for us, and I'm sure the other vendors, uh, was this keeps data sets manageable. It keeps them smallish. Um, and it also helps with this kind of um, contamination kind of concern some people have of, you can say all data for this one case is here. I'm going to archive it. It is separate from this case over there. So every case in autopsy has a folder. Uh, it's got a database, whether it's SQLite or Postgres, depending on if you're single user or multi-user. You've got a solar index, a bunch of other things, but they're all contained uh, you know, at a case level. 
And then, you know, given that how much of forensics and its response is the past, uh, you can bring in your past knowledge uh, by things like hash sets and keyword lists. Uh, we have a concept called interesting file rules, uh, which are basically folder and file name rules to flag things. Uh, the next release has got a whole bunch of rules on like cryptocurrency wallets and uh, cloud storage, a bunch of things. But you can basically bring in static information from past cases uh, to help you with your current case. Great. Most tools have this kind of this kind of concept. So Autopsy also has a long-term memory. Uh, we call it the central repository. And this allows you to span cases uh, and is dynamically updated. Right, so as you do things in the uh, software, uh, this database gets updated uh, based on what you're doing. Uh, you can have it be a single user or multi-user, so SQLite or Postgres. Um, and what it stores, the database, what it stores is identifiers from your cases. So as you're processing a case, identifiers get put in there and you can later use them. So we're storing things like MD5 hash values, uh, email addresses, USB device IDs, uh, Wi-Fi IDs, ICC IDs, domain names, a whole bunch of stuff. There's probably a dozen things uh, that we're stowing away in there for future reference. Uh, we also store the notion of the case, the data source, and the path that you saw each of these in. Uh, if you make a comment on the file, we'll store that. If you tag a file, we'll store that. Basically, we're storing this kind of information on the things that are in your cases uh, and, and how, to, how to kind of remember uh, where they actually came from. Um, this was kicking around uh, internally for quite a while. Uh, we first released it in 2017, uh, but you had to kind of opt in. You had to turn it on. Um, and the reason was that there's a lot of people that were concerned about this kind of concept, uh, mainly in law enforcement with search warrant scope. Uh, of they didn't want to kind of be using data from a child pornography case uh, in a drug case, et cetera. So it was turned off by default while we kind of figured some things out, um, but it's become much, much more, more useful. And so now it is on by default, as we'll see a little bit later on, uh, but we've changed kind of the default ways we use it uh, to kind of still uh, satisfy the concerns about if people should be using it or not, depending on kind of search warrants and uh, in, in, in scope of that. So here's the architecture of this, right? Uh, on the left-hand side here, uh, you have the current case database. Here's autopsy, uh, and it can now access this historical data uh, as well as the keyword list, IOCs, hash sets, et cetera. So how do you get data in there? So there's an ingest module. So for those who uh, went to the autopsy training or uh, just haven't seen it before, uh, there's a concept of ingest modules that run on the data source as you add it, or you can run them afterwards. This is where you do things like open up zip files or pull out EXIF or run email extraction. Um, and there's a module called central repository. Now in past versions, up until the one coming out in a couple of weeks, it was called correlation engine. Uh, it's now been renamed to central repository, but it's the same idea. This module is responsible for getting data into that central repository based on hash values uh, or things that like the email parser is gonna find with email addresses uh, or domain names. Uh, the other way it gets updated is it's always listening. So when you tag a file, when you right click on something, you say add file tag, uh, it, it's monitoring that and it'll record the fact that you tagged that file uh, and we'll keep track of that. So how do you use it, right? We, that, that's how the data gets in. It's just, it's passive, right? You don't have to know it's there, right? You just keep that module enabled uh, and stuff will be going into that. The only thing you'll notice is that it gets bigger and bigger, uh, but you know, it, it shouldn't be a problem. So now you need to use that data. So one easy thing is that you can automatically flag files uh, that were marked notable uh, in a past case. We use the word notable, we used to call it bad. Uh, we were told that was kind of judgmental. So now we call it notable, it's relevant. So um, it's called notable and it's basically a dynamic hash set, right? There are some labs that when an examiner finishes their case, uh, they will make, they will update their own local hash set with all the things that were tagged. So there's kind of an additional fa uh, final step to make an uh, update their hash sets of things that they found in this case to make sure in the future they also uh, find those things. Um, this is dynamic. This happens automatically. As soon as you tag something, we're now keeping track of that. And if you see again in the future, um, you'll see in the tree under interesting items, those will get flagged as things that were previously tagged as notable on a past case. You'll click on it and you'll see all the places it was tagged before. Um, you'll also see it in the table. So in the upper right hand corner, and we saw that three panel uh, layout, uh, there's a table. There's three columns uh, that usually occur in the very beginning, S, C, and O. O is occurrences. Um, so this column will tell you how many times this file uh, or other kind of artifact was seen uh, in past cases. 
Uh, so this can tell you if you're looking at a, a folder of files, you can say, oh my God, I've seen that 50 times, I don't really care. Uh, or I've never seen it before, maybe I should focus on that. So this is an easy way for you to see this. And again, uh, our view on this, and we are not lawyers, uh, but this is a very kind of passive use of this past data, right? The last one you could argue uh, is a bit kind of, yeah, maybe you're searching data of two different case types and you don't want to do that for a search warrant scope. Um, this one is much more passive. This is much more just saying, hey, how common or rare is this file that I'm looking at um, and not kind of really correlating uh, or finding intelligence or information, uh, you know, kind of based off of that. Um, second one is on the on the lower right hand corner. Uh, we have the other occurrences view, and this is basically showing that if you choose an item, this will show you where else it's been seen before. So it's organized such as this, where the left hand side are all the cases uh, that you saw that in, uh, the data sources that were in, the file name. Uh, this basically allows you to kind of figure out you've seen this file before. Uh, maybe it is relevant, uh, you know, for its part of the past case. Maybe just you want to see how where it actually is elsewhere. But it's basically an easy way for you to kind of dive into a given item you found some way to see where else you've seen it. These are the main uses of, of, of this data for quite a while, right? It's on this notion of correlation and remembering your past data. Um, but we, the past year or so, we started to use it in, uh, in different ways, which is on ranking, right? So as I mentioned before, we've been focusing a lot on how do we kind of go beyond Alta Vista and into Google uh, and make sure that people can see with all these like overwhelming amounts of data to find the relevant data first. The general theory that we have here is if you've seen a file 10 times before, and it wasn't relevant, it's probably not relevant the 11th time either. And if you've seen a file 50 times before, that's even less relevant than one you've only seen five times before, right? And so we can use these things as a way to kind of prioritize the data you've seen. That's not to say this file you've seen 50 times before is actually, it could still be relevant, but it's, it's, we wanna focus on the unique things probably first uh, and the things that were previously marked as bad. So we can do this with a central repository that has all the data. We know what files we never tagged. We know what files we've seen before and other artifacts, domain names, email addresses, all of those things. And we can use it to deprioritize the boring stuff and focus on the unique and probably relevant stuff. So to satisfy this, we have the data. Uh, we have a new UI, it's called File Discovery. Uh, it came out in the January uh, release of Autopsy this past year. Um, it's a search UI. And the main idea is to allow the user to define uh, what they're looking for. Now, full disclosure, this is an incrementally uh, released feature. I'm a big proponent of, you know, making small incremental releases on things, getting feedback, learning about stuff, trying it uh, versus spending two years on some major thing and realized it didn't really quite work or it's a little bit different. So every quarter this has been coming out with new features uh, and the, the whole thing kind of changed a bit as we learn stuff uh, and apply stuff with this. But the basic idea is the user picks things that they care about and how they want to see the results. And by having this repository and all this data, it allows the user to focus on uh, and display based on past occurrence. So for example, here's some get queries we have based on pictures, just because they're simple. Uh, there's equivalent ones for executables uh, for, for more of the incident response people in the audience. Uh, but here's just kind of a, a, an obvious one for, for images and pictures, right? If you want to see all unique uh, or rare pictures uh, that are big, and you can organize them by parent folder. So the basic idea here is that you, you as the examiner wanna focus on possibly user created images that are big, um, and you wanna see them in the same structure they organize, the owner uh, organize them if they had some kind of folder structure to mean certain things. So you can do that. You can define in, I want big and rare, uh, and I want them organized by parent folder. Um, sometimes you want to show all pictures though, um, but organized by frequency, right? So you may just want all big pictures, but you want to see the unique ones first uh, and then focus on the other ones. You can, so you can define the same criteria, uh, but now you're going to uh, use size as a feature uh, and group them by, um, by frequency. So um, UI looks like this. There's a, you can choose the, uh, the, the type. Right now we have these three. Uh, web artifacts is coming next. Um, executables will be after that. Uh, step two is kind of define the criteria you want. So based on size, based on data sources they're in, based on the past occurrences that they are. Uh, you pick the display options. So you pick how you want to group them. So instead it's giving you a long laundry list of thousands of files. Uh, we force you to choose how to group them. It could, again, it could be based on size, could be based on past occurrences, could be based on parent folder, all depends on your goals and how you want to rank them. 
Uh, you get results such as this. So again, this is more of a, a picture. Uh, this is actually from the same autopsy training set. Uh, these are grouped based on size uh, in unique pictures only. Uh, and so we see here, these are all the large files, which are in the range of one to 50 megabytes. The medium pictures are 100K to uh, one megabyte. Uh, we de-dupe them. So you can see here, this file was shown, was actually in two different locations. Uh, we only show it here once. We show you both locations, and then you can have the same viewer down here uh, to kind of dive into um, you know, all these different things. Uh, there's a similar view for videos where we show you video thumbnails. Uh, if there's a document, we'll show you kind of a summary of the documents, a, a few lines of text. Um, web things, we're going to have more of a domain-based view of this. So you can like view the different domains, which ones have the most activity, uh, et cetera. So that's kind of the basic idea. Um, it's a really powerful tool. Uh, I got to admit, we, um, we at some of our our sites where we have, uh, you know, we help manage and run, uh, we've had this data uh, central repository running for over two years. Um, so we have, you know, over two years of production data uh, that are coming through some of these labs, um, and it's been really amazing to then fire this up and look at new cases. And it really allows you to kind of focus in on the things that are probably relevant because uh, you can see what's unique. Uh, and, and NSRL is a great tool, a great utility uh, for like, executables and things, but it really helps you to, to kind of ignore all of the, the web icons uh, and things that you may find on the internet and things that are just kind of boring and common uh, and really focus on the things that are unique uh, to that person. So uh, now let's move to cyber triage. That was all about autopsy. Uh, now let's move to cyber triage. And, th and th that, that tool is kind of an evolving thing. Uh, for the next year at least, we will have kind of incremental features uh, you know, for all that coming out. There's a lot of, a lot of movement on that. Um, so now let's talk about cyber triage. So the central repository is great, right? It's collecting this data. We're always finding new ways to actually use it. But uh, the central repository is your history, right? It only knows about what you've put into it. Um, and this is good and bad. Right, um, it's bad because you haven't seen everything before, um, and it may take a while to build that data up. As I mentioned before, we have some people who have you know two years of data on their systems. Um, some folks have zero, or some folks may only have for the past four months when we actually turn it on by default to start collecting this data to be used for the kind of relevance ranking. Um, but it's good because honestly, something is better than nothing, right? Having four months of data to help you with that is better than no months of data. So this will keep on improving for everybody. Um, and the other reason this is good is because many labs are offline. And even if there's some bigger picture global repository, they're not gonna access it. And at least if they have their own data, that's better than no data at all. So, you know, this is good and bad, right? For the, for the CR uh, being kind of just your data. But we changed it for, for our, our cyber triage tool. Or we're in the process of changing it. So what is cyber triage? So cyber triage is our intrusion, uh, automated intrusion forensics tool. So while autopsy is a general purpose tool, right, that you can use for uh, intrusions or, or murder cases or, um, you know, fraud cases or terrorism cases or child pornography cases, right, you can use it for anything, right? Um, Cyber triage is hyper focused on just intrusion related artifacts, right? So it knows where to find the artifacts for things like startup items and auto runs and program uh, run uh, items, web artifacts, WMI actions, logins, networks, all the artifact types you care about for intrusions around user activity and malware. Um, it knows where to find those things. It brings them in, it scores them, uh, and gives you kind of scores as bad or suspicious. And then the user can then review the high threat items and dive in. So there's a big concept in cyber triage of this notion of, of ranking to kind of elevate the things uh, that you should spend your time on versus just dumping uh, a whole bunch of process data uh, or things in front of you to try and figure out which are the most likely to look at. So here's a screenshot of that. A bit different than autopsy. Uh, Left-hand side are all data types, uh, user uh, things, accounts, logins, what network shares they accessed, what programs they ran, uh, web artifacts they accessed, uh, you know, malware around persistence, things that are running, etc. So you can choose these things. It's a timeline on the right-hand side that shows you kind of what the time stamps are for the um, the bad items to allow you to kind of get a mental model of the events. But basic kind of you know easy to use kind of navigate uh, tool, uh, and these things are showing you kind of the, the, the bad and the suspicious items. So let's talk about the memory, right? Back to autopsy that had short-term and long-term memory. Um, 
Cyber triage is similar, right? Uh, Cyber triage started its life off actually as an autopsy module. Uh, they went their own ways uh, because autopsy was, uh, Cyber triage was so much more focused on uh, different kinds of data and live running systems and the infrastructure to have collection tools, uh, you know, running and, and, and just kind of different infrastructure. Um, but the same concepts are, still exist in cyber triage and autopsy. Right, so we have databases for storing the artifacts at an incident level. It's the same as the case. Uh, we just call them incidents in cyber triage. Uh, it remembers your past scores, your tags, your comments, et cetera, so that when you can see in your future uh, collections, you can see what you marked in the past, how common or rare something is. And so with this data, uh, when you look at an artifact, like a startup item or a program run entry, um, it'll show you what past cases you saw it in and if it was marked as bad uh, in the past. So again, we're trying to leverage as much as possible that past data to help you out. And with this, you can figure out, uh, is this artifact unique to the system um, or you know, other systems that may have it, right? So uniqueness is really important. As we discussed before uh, in the last talk, right, it's very important to find uniqueness because uh, those are usually the ones that are tied to uh, malware or attacks uh, and they're kind of the outliers. So being able to have that information is very useful. Um, and then once you do find that, you may find four or five other systems uh, as part of a scoping exercise uh, that you also want to see. And if you have that data available, it makes it easy to find those initial ones to start scoping to. So you can see this in cyber triage, uh, in the table view of cyber triage, on the right hand side, there's usually a column uh, that says seen before. Um, this data is actually a bit boring. Uh, it's, it's from one of my systems that I had to reset a little while ago. Uh, this is the downside of running a development uh, environment as well. But it basically shows you that, um, you know, this, this item here uh, must be a Chrome executable. Um, was you know seen 12 times before, which is all the incidents. Uh, this one was seen none before. Uh, this number here is if they were marked as bad before, but it allows you to kind of dive in and see how common or rare something is as part of that. So that's great, right? That helps you find the outliers, um, you know, uh, just that you know of as part of your past cases. Um, but you know, you can focus on the unique ones. It's all good, um, but sometimes your past cases aren't enough. Right, uh, we have several cyber triage customers who, uh, you know, don't do a, a lot of intrusion investigations. Right, maybe they do them once a month, um, and, and they like the kind of the ease of use of cyber triage. But it takes a while for them to get all that data built up to really get an idea of common or rare. And maybe they're actually part of, you know, they have a whole bunch of other security roles, and they aren't memorizing all the processes that they need to be keeping track of uh, at all times. And so they want kind of more context about what startup items and things are actually common or rare. Uh, in, in environments. Uh, so would it be useful to know how common or rare something is uh, amongst others in the industry as overall? So um, we started to make this global repository uh, for file hashes. Um, again, we like to do things incrementally. So uh, focusing just on kind of file hashes as the first starting point. Um, and so we're building this up and we're gonna bring this into cyber triage uh, as a way of giving kind of bigger picture view on kind of how common or rare something is. So um, cyber triage comes along with uh, an online file reputation service. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a service endpoint that we have. Uh, it identifies a file as being good or bad or suspicious. Um, it's backed up by reversing labs, which is, a, which is a service like VirusTotal. It's got 40 plus malware scanning engines. Um, so when you're using cyber triage, you can upload hash values or file content uh, and get results back. And if we know about it, we'll tell you about it. Uh, we're also going to reversing labs and get their opinions on these things. Um, and it's been storing anonymous data uh, about hash frequency. So it's not tied to anyone. It's not stored with any association of who it came from, where it came from. Uh, it's just keeping track of that this hash value was requested, uh, in, information about it. Uh, and the idea here is that this has been going on since like February. Um, the idea here is that as this goes on, uh, we'll be able to kind of then provide results to you uh, as you're looking for things to find out, is this hash value unique? Uh, no one's been seen it before. Uh, is it rare that a couple of people have or a couple of users have? Uh, it's common, uh, et cetera. So we're not going to provide core numbers. We're just going to provide kind of generic information. Uh, and again, this is all anonymous, uh, you know, not tied to any specific kind of company or incident or whatever. But the idea here is that how can we provide some basic feedback to people about kind of frequency analysis uh, you know, of these items? So this is the architecture of that. Um, we have cyber treasure in the middle here. It's got its local instant database, its local historical repository, and then has access to uh, this global historical repository to get information on kind of frequency analysis uh, in the community. 
Um, after we, we roll this out, uh, there's also plans to roll this to other artifact types. Uh, again, in the incremental idea here, start with file hashes. That's pretty easy. We understand file hash functions. Um, but the idea here is that how do we extend that concept to other data types uh, besides just file content? So one example, this is all TBD. Uh, it hasn't been finalized yet, but for startup items, right? Uh, one way to kind of make a hash uh, for a startup item would be to normalize the path uh, and kind of hash the string. So maybe the path is, you know, C, users, JDO, app data, local temp, you know, blah.exe is the program being run uh, as a startup item. Uh, one idea is, uh, you know, we normalize it, so we make it all lowercase. Uh, we pull out the username, JDO here, that's irrelevant uh, to what the actual username is. Uh, and that will kind of, you know, different usernames will cause different, uh, different you know, hash values. Um, make it all lowercase, uh, and then run it through SHA-256 or MD5, whichever, whichever we choose for that. Um, but that becomes kind of a hash value uh, for that startup item. Maybe we want to tie in the key that it was in, whether it was kind of a run once, Maybe it's irrelevant. There's a bunch of things to think about here as part of this. But the idea here is that once we roll this out, um, to start to kind of do this for other items. Uh, and ideally, this is a kind of a community effort, right? There's nothing unique here uh, that we're doing as part of this. So ideally, there's some kind of concept of we can all build up uh, hashes for different kinds of artifacts to allow us to correlate these things anonymously, um, you know, it, it, with lookup tables kind of things versus more very descript and verbose kind of JSON-y kind of things. Um, and also coming soon, uh, before the other stuff, uh, is that autopsy will use this as well. So uh, by the end of the year, I, 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 I assume, uh, we will have an autopsy module that will be able to use the same repository. And so when you're running data sets through autopsy, uh, it can reach out to that REST API uh, and query that and both use the malware scanning capabilities uh, as well as kind of give you that frequency analysis uh, you know, for how common or rare something is, uh, just to give you that more context uh, in, your, in your investigations uh, and how common or rare something is uh, you know, around the world. So uh, in summary, right, uh, saving your data uh, can be really important uh, to solving, you know, your kind of future big data problems. And we all either currently have big data problems of kind of overwhelming data uh, or it, it's, it's getting even worse, uh, you know, coming up. And relevance and ranking, I think, are the huge uh, problem to solve uh, right now uh, in, in forensics outside of the usual. There's a lot of data types, a lot of databases to parse, all those kind of things. It's really about how do we make this data available and, and, and bump up the highest priority items uh, to the user and the examiner. So the basic idea here is don't throw your data away, right? Reuse it. Um, hopefully your tools uh, that you have uh, are able to kind of start keeping track of this um, and, and you can leverage it either now or in the future. Um, or maybe these global databases will kind of help out as well. But even if you don't do it locally, you can benefit from that by others uh, kind of putting their in. And remember the great old uh, classic saying uh, by that guy carrier on uh, those who can't remember the artifacts they saw before are condemned to analyze them again. Um, two other quick things. Uh, OSDFCon uh, is our annual open source event. Uh, we've had it for 10 years now. Uh, October 21th, 2020 is the current date for it. Um, it will be virtual this year as everything else is with all these events going on. The agenda is still being figured out. Uh, we crowdsource voting for the agenda and that finished last week, I think. Um, but topics typically included incident response, memory, uh, you know, correlation, whole bunch of cloud, whole bunch of things uh, are there. Um, it's always been free for US government employees. Uh, we're still trying to figure out all the registration details uh, with kind of the, the virtual notion uh, you know, of it this year. Uh, but there is a website down below, osgfcon.org. You can sign up for updates on there uh, if you aren't already to be notified uh, when that uh, becomes available. Um, so that there's training. So uh, there is an hour, eight hour online training available for autopsy. Uh, I saw a bunch of references to it already in the Discord um, app. Uh, we offered it for free. Uh, for a while for COVID. Um, I thought we'd get a few thousand people who signed up for it, uh, take advantage of it. We had 100,000 people uh, enroll for that and go through. It was crazy. Uh, there was a lot of support uh, tickets and things that went through there. Uh, thanks to Brian Moran for helping out with all of that. Um, uh, the training though is still free for US law enforcement through 2020. Uh, we made this through some DHS uh, science technology uh, contracts and grants. Uh, and so uh, that therefore it's still free for US law enforcement uh, through the end of the year. Um, and then cyber triage, we've got a free um, 
three hour kind of intro IR training coming out next month. Uh, and then there'll be an eight hour uh, class coming in the fall uh, you know, for that. Uh, downloads contact, uh, you can get autopsy for free at autopsy.com. Uh, there's a free evaluation uh, for cyber triage at cybertriage.com. Uh, there's my email. Uh, you can catch me on LinkedIn uh, or Twitter. Uh, I am terrible at both of them. I will be honest, uh, but email is much more reliable to actually get in touch with me. Um, so that's it. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. There's some great conversation going in the uh, in the Discord, and a bunch of questions came in as well. Um, I'll be honest, I don't think we'll have time to get through all the questions here with you, but I wanted to pick, um, there's a couple of them that were in a similar theme, kind of centering around uh, or centering on uh, scalability. Um, there were some questions on scalability with the uh, the database or if Hadoop is concern, uh, being considered in, in EO one size, like, is there any general metrics you can provide about scalability? And most of those questions were specifically on the autopsy side of the talk. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so we, we've done quite a bit to kind of um, make, you know, in, in our experience, so, so, so con content wise, uh, you know, or infrastructure wise, uh, as I mentioned before, it's all relational at this point, right? It's Postgres, uh, you know, for kind of the, the one to scale the most. Um, when we first kicked this off, we did a bunch of evaluations on relational versus uh, Mongo versus Elastic versus whatever. Um, Postgres gave us by far the best performance, uh, you know, for kind of inserting and querying uh, for that. Um, and essentially, it's because all we're doing is making rows, right? We're making basic rows of here's the hash value, here's the case name, here's the file, you know, the case index or ID reference, whatever. Um, and they're actually pretty fast uh, you know, inserts that we do when we batch them up. So um, it, 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 that was by far the best performance, uh, you know, wise of that. Um, things like Hadoop really become important if we want to um, actually do a lot of kind of uh, clustering analysis or things. We found that's better for, for clustering things. But for the simple task that we're doing of more of like inserts uh, and query to see how common or rare something is, um, I mean, Postgres is, is, is really good, uh, good enough for that. Um, we do break the, 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 the tables up by type uh, to keep them small, right? In our experience, the real performance hits comes when tables get far too big. Uh, and so we have been doing a lot to kind of keep the tables small uh, to keep, you know, file hashes separate than, uh, you know, domains separate than email addresses, separate than whatever, uh, to kind of keep those, keep those small. But, you know, the, the final thing is that, you know, we, we do have, the, uh, you know, this place that, uh, or a couple places that have, you know, a couple years of data on them. Um, this is not the bottleneck, right? Solar uh, historically has been more the bottleneck uh, for kind of performance uh, in things than, than actually maintain this database just for kind of context and for reference. Yeah, I've seen that a number of times as well. Um, so excellent. Well, I, I realize we're getting ready to head into lunch. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to ask our moderators to not kill off the, the questions that are still outstanding. I'm going to get those. Don't worry. I'll actually copy paste those into your hallway. Um, okay. It'll be a bit of a, a dump, but that way we're not losing because there are some really good questions that I, I think you'll have some quick, easy insight to. It's just with, with the timing, I don't want to uh, I don't want to push stuff too too far one way or the other. Sure. Um, so that all said, thank you very much for sharing with us. Um, excellent material as always. Really, some some of the classic tools in the the forensic toolkit, and it's uh, it's always nice to to hear from someone such as yourself who's so close to the creation of tools like that, and uh, really give us the it's the closest information we can get on them. So it's uh, it's pretty awesome. Get the info right from the source. Thanks, so. Um Absolutely. Thank you for your time and for sharing. Thank you.